I was driving through Kenya once. Um, the chap I was with is a very knowledgeable biologist and an expert on elephants. Suddenly he said, uh, did you hear that pitter patter? And I said, no, what? He said, well, you were charged by a rhino. I said, we've got, yes, he said, yeah. but of course, dummy charge. There's another pitter patter, but this time it didn't fade away. This time, wallop, hit the back end of the land over and actually lifted it up, shook it. And uh, I remember seeing his hands on the wheel, uh, showing white at the knuckles, as, as the thing came the second time. Crash, bang, and, and, shook, and, and then he backed off, and I said, uh, hell of a dummy charge, that boy, no joke. <laughs> He came in the third time, wrecked the back wheel, ripped up the uh, uh, up the car, uh, and by the time it was finished, the car was undrivable. David can't go anywhere without being recognised by someone. His popularity spans the generations. It's the only stuff on telly worth watching. And this level of fame is something he's had to get used to. By the mid-60s, David Attenborough had become a household name. Mr. David Attenborough here, bless his heart. Then, still in his 30s, an unexpected opportunity came his way. The BBC needed young blood to run their brand new channel, BBC Two. I remember deliberately saying to myself, now, you've got to make up your mind, Attenborough, are you a television man or are you some kind of scientist? Um, and I decided uh, that at that time that I was really, at heart, a television man. Therefore, if I was a television man, there could not be a more interesting job in the whole of the television than that was one that was being offered to me. We shall continue to look for the new stars, the experimental stars. As controller of BBC Two, David introduced a new wave of programming that would stand the test of time. He also pioneered a whole new era of television, as the BBC raced to make Britain the first nation in Europe to broadcast in colour. Then, of course, we discovered that, in fact, Germany was preparing to go into colour. And, and <laughs> this, you must remember, this was in the, in the 60s. And, um, so there was sort of still a sort of feeling about Germany, you know. We'd, we'd just won the war, after all. And I was thinking, oh, you know, come on, BBC should be the first in colour in Europe. And it suddenly dawned on me we could use uh, colour cameras in Wimbledon. Um, and with just four or five colour cameras, which was all I think we had, we could get hours and hours and hours of colour television. We would launch as soon as we could do at least 50% of the programmes in colour. And, and Wimbledon allowed us to do that. And what is more, it allowed us to get on the air before Germany did. David's challenge was to promote the virtues of colour TV. He came up with a new concept, a series of big budget programmes designed to showcase colour in all its glory. The first of this new genre of landmark programmes, known then as sledgehammers, was an arts programme called Civilization. It was going to be the finest things that Western European had produced artistically uh, from uh, the beginning of the 5th, 6th century onwards, which simply had a, a phenomenal success. BBC Two was riding high, so we commissioned a Ascent of Man there and then. Ascent of Man was the model for science television. If I'm to take the Ascent of Man back to its beginnings, it set a trend for the epic programming for which David is now synonymous. And epic programs need epic shots. So somebody needs to be up on the hill um, who can give David the cue. For here, you can see fossils of the very first animals that evolved on this planet. Yeah, that was good for us. This location is a key place in the story of the first life. 
The rocks here are covered in 600 million year old fossils from the same family as the one found in Leicestershire where David grew up. Okay, David, if you could sort of gesture towards this one, we're going to do a pull focus to this one. Oh, that was fantastic. Um, you know, I've, I've grown up to believe that that little fossil in the Charnwood Forest, that long, just one of them, was one of the most precious fossils in the world. And now I'm walking over them. Dozens of them. Well, hundreds of them. Literally hundreds of them. It's a good place for David to indulge his passion for photography. Uh, aren't we right in thinking that the photograph on the front of Life on Earth was one of yours? You are, you are absolutely correct, absolutely correct. I heard this terrible noise in my ear as I lay in a, on a camp bed. Not on a camp bed, I lay on the ground on a, in the Panama, like somebody hitting a mallet, um, anvil with a mallet. I turned around and there's this. I went click and it was a frog. It was a front cover of Life on Earth. Look at that. You see how this boy's got talent in his fingers he just doesn't know about. <laughs> <laughs> what, what on earth is that? <laughs> you panicked and pressed the button by accident, right? <laughs> Filming moves across Canada to the Rocky Mountains. The next location is a remote fossil quarry some 2,000 metres above sea level and getting there isn't easy. David and the crew will need to fly part of the way and then hike for half an hour up a steep, icy path. I'm going to give you a quick safety briefing here on the helicopter. So this one is done up, it doesn't hang out like that. Just put your headset on, you don't have to press any buttons to talk, it's just voice activated. I just wish I could remember any of these, any of these instructions. Somebody's like with their air hostess on there on jet line. I can't remember a thing. Uh, well, if you look above you, there's some clouds um, in the sky. Those getting thicker, which means that you can't fly. So we've got to get up there, see if we can land, find the spot for the piece, and then get out before it all closes over. The original one there. there we are. Thank you, sir. I do appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody who's bought one of my books deserves to have it signed. Oh, you can't say that. I'm still here. <laughs> Every day is a highlight for me. Of course it is, yeah, Martin. Thank you very much. This one is the best so far, definitely. Yeah. Uh, what was wrong with yesterday? Well, we weren't filming, David. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Quite right. <laughs> David may be an octogenarian, but his determination is just as it ever was. We've planned this in so many ways. We've discussed having uh, helicopters airlifting him up in a sort of sling underneath. We've had the possibility of a sedan chair to, to come up here, but actually David's perfectly fine and perfectly willing, so um, all our anxieties are evaporating away, really. And maybe some time. The struggle will be worth it. Near the summit, David will find one of the richest fossil locations in the world, the Burgess Shales. Here, they're found all over the place. They're called trilobites. That's the head, there's the middle bit. David is so interested in things. He's fascinated by everybody. I mean, if there's a table of people, he'll say, who's that and what do they do? He's fascinated by that. You know, David reads endlessly. I mean, on the plane, he read two books coming out from England. Um, he absorbs. His study is full of books that he's reading. He's up to date with science. He's reading the latest science papers. This is a man who I think will go on and on because I think he's so fascinated by the world as long as he can walk, as long as he can move around he'll be interacting with it. Filming at the top of a mountain is not without hazards as the weather closes in. Unfortunately, the clouds come down. We have got a helicopter here. The pilot also wants to go home. We wouldn't mind not spending a night on the mountain. So I guess we won't be able to stay here for too long. But at the moment, the mist is down. We're going to have to get into the chopper and sit there ready to go, and if it lifts, and if you can see the lake at the bottom, then with any luck, we might put our heads on a pillow tonight in the warmth. Here's hoping. 
There's plenty to keep David busy while he waits for the weather to clear. There are fossils everywhere. Okay, fellas. He says it's time we left. There you go. Thanks a lot. No problem, eh? Really great. How was it, David? <sighs> Terrible. <laughs> Well, do you mind being taken up to these far-flung, inhospitable places? No, that's why I'm here. I don't mind. <laughs> that's what I came for. <laughs> Back in the 70s, David's passion for exploring far-flung places was the catalyst for his resignation from management at the BBC. The success of his commissions only served to remind the desk-bound Attenborough of the life he was missing. I was fretting a bit and, and concluding that my life, the rest of my life, was not to be spent behind a desk. I, I, I couldn't bear it. Um, and so I managed uh, to resign for after eight years of administration. And the first thing I did on, on, on having resigned was the head of the Natural History Unit uh, came to see me and said, look, don't you think it would be a great idea if we did a 12-part series about the natural world and would you do it? Oh, I said, what a good idea. There are some four million different kinds of animals and plants in the world. Four million different solutions to the problems of staying alive. This is the story of how a few of them came to be as they are. Life on Earth was the series that would define David as the world's greatest natural history presenter. It gave him the opportunity to go to the places he'd always dreamed of and to see the animals he'd always wanted to see. But much more than that, it revolutionized the viewer's perspective of the small world in which they lived. It was only in the mid-70s that you had really such a comprehensive airline service around the world, such a reliable airline service around the world, that you could go pretty well anywhere. Which meant that in the programmes, we could, we could hop uh, from the Barrier Reef uh, to uh, the Sahara, just like that, if you wanted to do so, in a shot. And then, about 20 or 30 years ago, people realised that they'd been looking in the wrong rocks and in the wrong way. These are the right rocks. It had... Uh, and a sort of liberating effect that somehow, uh, and this was just after the, the moon shots, of course, that somehow, for the first time, where you were getting a vision of the natural world, of the globe, of the earth, with the, this the zoosphere, with, the, with the, the, the animals and plants that clothed it all, you were, for the first time, getting a comprehensive view of that. Um, and, and people felt that quite, quite clearly. So it seems really very unfair that man should have chosen the gorilla to symbolize all that is aggressive and violent when that's the one thing that the gorilla is not and that we are the reason we had gone to gorillas was in order to illustrate a point i was making about the evolutionary significance of climbing primates of climbing mammals who had to grasp branches uh, and to grasp a branch, you, uh, you need to be able to put your thumb and your forefinger together like that. So, on the day in question, I crawled off and prepared to go on about the thumb and the forefinger. Um, and as I was about to say that, I suddenly felt a, a weight on my feet, and there was a baby gorilla undoing my shoelaces. Um, uh, well, it didn't seem to be the right moment to, to be talking about the thumb and forefinger. And while I was concluding on that, a hand came down on, on my head, and there was the, the adult female. And she opened my mouth, I put a hand, a huge, great hand, on the jaw and stuck a finger in my mouth. And I couldn't talk about the thumb and forefinger even then. By this time, I was in a sort of delirium, really. I mean, it was just seemed paradisial. I mean, it was absolutely extraordinary. It took my breath away. It did cause um, a huge sensation that here is a presenter looking at the camera when suddenly a, a gorilla comes out of the bush and sits on him. I mean, <laughs> it's quite odd. <laughs>